Frank, thank you so much for for uh, going early. We really, really appreciate it. And you know what? I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I'm That's turning right. it over to you. Thank well, you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you uh, so much for that. And thank you all for joining today. Um, I'm here to talk about a far less prosaic discussion, and that is MSO expansion and acquisition strategy across the United States. Um, before we jump in, um, TerraTech, my company, uh, let me back up actually, I'm Frank Nuttall. I'm the uh, CEO of TerraTech, um, and we operate in uh, California, Nevada, and, and I'll share with you our, our uh, path forward uh, towards the end of the presentation after discussing um, MSO expansion and acquisitions. But TerraTech is a public company and I'm obligated by the gazillions of lawyers that we work with. And I'm sure everyone out here works with as well in this industry to let everyone know that um, the presentation may contain forward-looking statements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now you have been so notified. Uh, so taking a look at the operating environment, um, as a number of the earlier presenters mentioned, um, you know, there are relatively few states that have uh, no uh, uh, framework around which you know, cannabis can be produced, consumed, sold, or in some other manner distributed. Um, there's uh, you know, approximately 16 states that have legalized it on a, on a full basis for adult use and med. And then there's you know, another 35 or 38 states that have uh, varying degrees of medical, uh, uh, medical use or decriminalization. So the darker um, states here are, are ones where it's fully legalized for adult use and, and med. Um, and then the lighter colors become, the more restricted the states are uh, with respect to the regulatory environment. So for MSOs to expand, uh, they're really looking at approximately 45 you know, or so different discrete markets, you know, much like um, one of the earlier presenters was talking about moving into various countries in Germany or in Europe, you've got Germany and, and Portugal uh, and Spain, all of which have their own regulatory frameworks environments. Uh, the same is very much the case in the United States where uh, states have uh, very different frameworks uh, for expansion or operation within the, in their borders. Um, in particular, um, you know, there's uh, the med and adult use that um, we discussed. There's state and local regs. Uh, for example, in California, while it's legal at the state level, uh, local jurisdictions have the right to opt out, uh, which creates a very distorted environment. For example, Santa Ana has approximately two dozen dispensaries in the city, and there are no other cities in Orange County that currently have uh, legal cannabis. Uh, although there are a couple that are knocking on the door. So it's just a very difficult environment um, to consider expansion plans and strategy. Um, and there's really two ways that, that MSOs can go about that. One is by way of acquisition, uh, and the other is by way of organic growth. And by that, I mean uh, you know, uh, applying for licenses directly with the state. Um, a little bit more in the regulatory environment. So uh, as I discussed, state regulations pose a challenge to expansion um, in that each state has its own framework. Um, in addition, a lot of those states actually have made it very difficult or, or put in place rules to, uh, to forestall MSO expansion. So uh, the state in which I'm located, Colorado, um, had uh, up until uh, a little over a year ago, restrictions on public companies owning any licenses. Other states have, for example, with Massachusetts, capped the number of licenses that any company could own to three medical and three adult use. Um, you know, on top of that, there's residency requirements, potential social equity requirements, local ownership requirements, uh, all of which you know, make it you know, a, a more difficult to uh, move into new states. And then once you're there to operate in them because it's a totally separate legal and regulatory environment. Uh, as I also mentioned, on top of that, there's also local regulations. Um, on one side, you've got uh, Colorado, where um, you know the only regulatory local regulations really are how close you are to schools and, and that sort of thing. Whereas in California, as I mentioned, you can um, local districts can restrict um, entirely for you know for whatever local reason they so choose. Um, 
a little bit about the history of, of uh, acquisitions and M&A activity on industry. And, and, you know, while the industry goes back, um, you know, to you know, 09, 010 uh, in Colorado and Oregon, you know, when I look at recent historic uh, details, I'm really looking at, you know, 17, 18 and early 19. And in that period of time, there was this massive land grab. Um, and an enormous amount of capital was flowing into the industry from family offices and, and, and um, operated banks in Canada. Um, and it was fueling this mad dash to acquire assets. Uh, along the way, of course, as, as we later learned out, uh, that a lot of these assets were acquired uh, with little or no planning or integration management, uh, due diligence, uh, oft times there was little or even no strategy uh, on the process, no budgeting, no forecasting. Um, and at the same time, uh, because of the amount of, of capital coming into the industry, as well as soaring stock prices for cannabis companies in, in 17, 18, and, and into early 19, um, companies were being acquired at, at massive valuations. And, and a lot of it was done with paper uh, but there certainly was a certain number of transactions done with cash. Um, and, and it just was highly distorted if you look at the multiples on revenue um, that were uh, being transacted at that time. And, and note, I didn't put multiples of, of EBITDA or, or, or earnings because frankly, um, A, there wasn't a lot of that and B, uh, there was no attention paid to it. Uh, moving forward into the you know, mid-19 or, or, or late-19 you know, through much of 2020, uh, the, the industry experienced a massive capital crunch, uh, declining asset values, declining stock prices, um, led to all kinds of restructurings, consolidations, um, and, and really a, a, you know, a very uh, similar situation for those who recall it to the dot-com bust in, in the early aughts. You know, my, I, I lived through that and, and managed through that. And frankly, the, the swiftness with which the capital crunch and, and declining asset valuations and market caps hit this time was really quite dramatic, uh, almost light switch in, in my experience. And, you know, the, the impact was that a lot of the companies that had spent 17, 18, early 19 expanding with the rest of cash in the industry found themselves with an enormous number of stranded assets in states, um, which you know, because of the regulatory environment I described, had um, you know, just massive inefficiencies relative to their core operations. Um, so moving on, um, you know, thanks to my friends at Viridian Capital and, and former colleagues, uh, I spent uh, part of 2020 uh, doing uh, restructuring work for Viridian. So uh, they've got an extraordinary database of M and A and financing activity in the industry. And you can see here a little bit graphically what I was referring to where in, in 19, we were looking at, you know, an average of probably seven to 10 or seven to nine M&A transactions per week uh, in our industry. And that's across uh, all different aspects, whether it's cultivation or, or dispensaries or whatnot. And you see in late 19, uh, where it, it really starts to decline and, and you know, from, from that point forward through 2020 and into early, very early 2021, we experienced you know, almost a, a, a complete dearth. And, and there was a, a drought of M&A activity where we're looking at anywhere from zero to two a week, you know, down from the seven to nine per week that we saw uh, in, in the prior period. Uh, going forward, I, I think um, you know, there's a, a fair amount of rationalization that, that occurred during 2020. And, and, uh, with the, the capital flight from the industry and, and declining market caps and asset values. And, and certainly, um, uh, you know, COVID had a role, although in some respects, uh, it might have actually mitigated the downside because cannabis in, in most states was deemed uh, as an essential item um, and provided for uh, dispensaries to remain open. In fact, at the very onset of, of COVID um, in May, April, or March, April of, of 2020, the state of Colorado actually announced that they were closing down the dispensaries, and uh, that announcement lasted 91 minutes. Uh, um, uh, so, you know, while COVID certainly had an impact, it, it may have actually blunted uh, some of the downturn because the um, 
the dispensaries were largely, or most states, allowed to remain open. Um, so going forward, I, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, synergistic uh, acquisitions and mergers, and, and by that I mean you know, more well thought out mergers and acquisitions where there are complementary assets uh, or states uh, and less of the uh, massive land grab that we saw in 17 and 18, um, where strategy and, and efficiencies, cost management, um, operational management are all coming into play. I mean, for us at Terratech, for example, we currently operate in uh, California and Nevada, uh, we just uh, agreed to acquire a company that operates in California and Oregon. Um, and, and the way we look at it, they're all contiguous states, um, same time zone, uh, easy flights between them all. And it's not like we are uh, moving into, for example, Oklahoma, where we have a single dispensary and you know, it's two or three time zones away and, and much more difficult. So I, I think there's going to be a, lo a lot more um strategic and operational approach to the consolidation uh, and the continued development uh, of the large MSOs going forward. With respect to the, um, the environment, uh, as I mentioned, or, or pre provided a precursor to the, the environment for m &A activity has, has definitely picked up. Uh, and we are approaching levels that we last saw in, in early 19. Not quite there yet, um, but um, there's certainly a lot more activity, and we're looking at you know sort of five to seven a week now, which is which is off the bottom of, of zero to two, but not quite at the seven to nine we we're looking at a year and a half or two years ago. So things are definitely picking um, uh, back up in, in the M and A space. The uh, the other approach to um, to growth for MSOs is, is organic, um, and that basically means filing license applications in states in which they uh, currently operate to expand their footprint, or in which they want to move to to uh, establish uh, operations in new states. Um, you know, it's, it's not a uh, not an easy process, and and you know, it's because of the complexity of it, and, and it's only gotten more complex. Um, you know, that drove a lot of the M&A activity as, as people uh, who acquired licenses or submitted license applications uh, in the earlier days of some of the first to legalize states uh, fed the M&A boom for, for quite some time. Um, and, and we'll probably still do so because the complexity and frankly, the randomness of, of getting new licenses. Um, it varies obviously by state because they all have their own regulatory environment. Uh, but the states uh, often have uh, significant uh, requirements on the um, new license uh, applications and issuances with respect to you know, residency or um, social equity uh, locations. You know, there's still in some cases prohibitions on um, the maximum number of licenses you can have. Um, so it, while organic growth is certainly an option, uh, for MSOs to expand their footprint, it is not uh, a very efficient uh, or tried and true option because the randomness of it all. Um, at one of my prior companies, um, uh, we operated in Ontario and at the point um, distribution was managed by the, uh, the country or the, 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 um, the region. And they actually apply or allow the um, opening of, of 35 licenses, but you know, a lot of the license holders uh, or folks that got issued licenses had zero real history in the industry. Um, and there was a mad dash to acquire those licenses um, just because the difficulty of, of larger firms and, and the, the unlikely uh, result of, of getting um, organic issuances. So, you know, from a um, organic growth perspective, um, there's a number of pros and cons. We've certainly talked about the cons in that it's, um, you know, the, the complexity of the regulatory environment. Uh, in some instances, the caps on, on licenses or other operating requirements, for example, in Florida, I don't believe this is still the case, but when Florida opened up, you had to be vertically oriented, uh, integrated um, and had to have a citrus partner, as I recall, uh, as part of the, uh, the application program. Um, in Massachusetts, you have to be uh, vertically integrated. So, you know, th there's certainly a lot of cons. The, the pros, of course, are it's a whole lot cheaper than buying your way in. Uh, and for a company that's got a established uh, retail footprint, 
it provides uh, an easier path to uh, establishing the, the retail brand that they are interested in expanding or building upon. Um, most of the uh, most of the MSOs have have uh, uh, gotten to their positions by way of acquisition. Although there are a couple, uh, you know, Juicy and, and Columbia Care that, that have largely um, uh, or, or have put more focus on organic growth. Um, so looking a little bit at, at you know the MSOs and, and details surrounding them um, uh, and, and the uh, you know complexities they face in, in expanding into new markets, uh, some of which we've already touched on. So as we mentioned, each state is basically its own um, operating environment. And so for a company moving into a new state, they largely have to have uh, distinct and separate compliance operations, distinct and separate legal uh, advisors, um, you know, different tax structures, uh, all of which make the um, you know getting economy of scale just that much more difficult uh, for any large MSO at this point. Uh, moving into a new state on a single or couple dispensaries is, is not generally economically viable. Uh, it's not enough to move their revenue needle and at the same time imposes considerable costs. And as a subsidiary of a public company operating um, in a particular state, a couple dispensaries are, are just harder uh, to, uh, to you know, make a, a good return on their investment. Obviously not universal. Uh, we certainly see in Planet 13, um, a, a company that has been very successful in operating uh, relatively few uh, dispensaries in any market, um, but that is, is you know, the exception and, and will, remains to be seen um, when they open their dispensary in Orange County um, uh, in Santa Ana amongst the two dozen or so other dispensaries, just how much you know, market share they're going to be able to pull in and will we'll have the, the same scope that, that they see in, in their Vegas operation. Um, so going forward, I, I think that you know for the MSOs, they, they will likely be making bigger bites in markets into which they move, just because of the economies of scale. Uh, also, uh, the integration initiative is, is easier uh, to do one large uh, integration versus a handful of small ones um, as they move into new states. Just taking a look at some of the big um, the big MSOs, we have a list here of the of the top seven. Uh, some of the basic metrics, uh, Cureleaf um, is is the largest with respect to the number of states in which they operate. Um, they also are the, the largest on a revenue basis. So um, they are um, you know clearly um, you know one of the leaders in, in the industry, um, and you know and. and all the rest of these are operating in you know, seven or more states. Uh, TrueLeaf is a, a bit of a unique example in that they're roughly the same size as, as CureLeaf uh, in a third of the number of states, but they have such a, a very deep penetration um, in um, in the Florida market that um, you know, which is which is a very sizable market in and of itself. That you know, they have uh, just a very large scope there. Turning a little bit to you know where we um, you know think Terratech fits in and and, and our uh, strategy and approach towards our expansion and how we see that uh, I'd like to set forth you know of those seven large MSOs you know what their current operations are in California um, and you know I, I guess the best way to put it is it's patchwork at best and very light um, in a state like the size of of California which is you know the largest. Uh, market in the U.S. And, and could well be the largest cannabis market in the world. Uh, the seven largest MSOs operating in the United States have essentially little or no footprint. Uh, TerraSend is, is probably the, the largest with one cultivation and five dispensaries. And that's in a state where the regulatory framework is more accommodating uh, than in many other states. Uh, is a very large market and has approximately 650 dispensary licenses. So of the seven largest MSOs, they have essentially no um, penetration in the California market. You might ask why that is. So um, the California market is, is, is a very odd market in which to operate. Um, at a state level, there's um, uh, an open and broad regulatory framework that's supportive of the industry. 
Uh, but as we've discussed, there's a certain number of um, layers of additional regula regulations, whether it's the county or at the municipality level that, that compound that. And even more problematic is, is frankly, California has such a very long history of illicit operations and um, a, a tax framework that uh, is among the higher of, of all the um, adult use states in the country, uh, putting a burden on the legal operations. So there's a history of illicit operations. The, the state has not been historically very good at, um, at managing uh, illegal operations and at the same time is, has taxed more heavily uh, legal operations than many other states. Uh, this has made it a bit more challenging to operate in California, uh, but at the same time, I will note that it does appear that the winds are starting to change. The, the California regulatory group is, is starting to recognize that, and I don't know why it took so long, that um, by, by not cracking down on illicit operations and, and overtaxing legal operations that in some respects, they're also hurting their own tax revenues. So there are movements in, ca in California now to uh, ramp up the initiative to close down illicit operations. Um, and in, a lot of municipalities are looking at reducing the, the tax environment uh, for various aspects uh, of the legal operation. Just one sort of sidebar on, on that, um, there's about 650 legal dispensaries in, in California. Uh, there's really no understanding of, of how many illicit dispensaries there are, but it, it is believed that it is well in excess of, of the number of legal ones, notwithstanding the, uh, the opportunity to go down to the proverbial street corner, uh, all in a state uh, more than you know, potentially any other in the country where outdoor cultivation is particularly, um, you know, particularly easy and profitable. So turning a little bit more directly to Terratech. Um, so we currently operate, as I mentioned, in, in um, California and Nevada. Uh, we have at the moment uh, two dispensary and two cultivation operations uh, are in the process of opening our third cultivation operation in California, second California, third overall, as well as a mixed use uh, facility uh, in Santa Ana that will house uh, dispensary, cultivation, processing, and manufacturing. In addition, I, I mentioned we entered an agreement recently to acquire Unrivaled. Uh, they operate in California and Oregon. They are one of the largest, if not the largest, distribution networks in, in the two states. Um, and they distribute their own, uh, their own brands as well as third-party brands. Uh, chief among the, their own brands is Carova, uh, which is a, a, you know, an old line storied brand in, in the, the West Coast. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, we have Cabana, uh, you know, a high-end um, boutique brand and, and sticks a little bit more of a lower shelf mass market brand. So we, um, we entered an agreement to acquire Unrivaled and, and anticipate closing that um, in early June, uh, which will provide us with um, distribution, as I mentioned, in, in California and Oregon, um, uh, distribution hubs in, in both states, uh, as in specifically Northern California, Southern California, and Portland. Uh, a dispensary currently operating in Santa Ana, uh, another one uh, opening in Los Angeles, um, uh, as well as uh, launching direct to consumer delivery in Oregon in the very near future. So together, we're looking at um, you know uh, getting a pretty deep footprint in uh, the three states in which we operate, and and our goal, overwhelming goal, is to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into these three states, uh, and provide an opportunity for you know, one of the larger MSOs or or some other party concentrated on the on the East Coast or elsewhere in the country that wants to have a footprint uh, on the West. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we believe strongly that um, as uh, some of the larger companies that have not historically been operating in, in California and the other Western states because of the uh, difficulty in doing so with respect to the illicit markets and tax regimes and everything else, um, that we feel that it'll be uh, you know, very strongly um, in favor of 
very large dominant players uh, in, the, in this region. So uh, wrapping it all up, um, I think it's, it's you know, our, our overriding uh, goal and strategy is, is to build a, a fully comprehensive business uh, in these three states, in, encompassing dispensaries, manufacturing, brands, cultivation, delivery, uh, and distribution, um, and provide an opportunity for you know, either a, a merger or, or some sort of outright acquisition at some future point um, that um, you know, really uh, wants to, to make a big play in, in, in our markets. Um, where you know, our, our expansion plans in, in these states are you know, largely follow um, you know, the, the M&A strategy uh, where we're looking to bolt on uh, complementary businesses uh, with a focus on uh, dispensaries and, and products uh, addressing aspects of the industry we don't uh, have much exposure to or, or don't have uh, significant exposure to, uh, to uh, extend the brands we are bringing on board from Unrivaled uh, into the Nevada market using our cultivation processing uh, joint venture as a uh, stepping stone. Um, one of the um, you know one of the things we joke about in the office is so many people have fled California for Nevada because of the tax environment that you know the Corova brand already has pretty strong name recognition in, in the Nevada market. Um, so that's uh, that's a big part of our expansion strategy is to bring the brands into Nevada, uh, acquire complementary businesses in, in each of the three states, um, and um, you know and just build a, a very formidable deep market leading company amongst those you know the, the Pacific Southwest. Additionally, um, the Corova brand name, as I mentioned, is an old and storied brand name. We're currently licensing it. Um, um, it should be Arizona, uh, Arizona, Oklahoma, um, and um, you know are looking for other, you know, especially Western states to uh, to roll out that license. Um, so that's that's sort of the prepared remarks I have for today. I, I'm certainly happy to to have conversation offline or, or answer any questions that, uh, that anyone may have. Thank you so very much, Frank. You're quite welcome. We really, really appreciate the time that you've taken with to uh, explain TerraTech and what's going on. So I actually do have a question for you. Sure. If you would um, be okay with going ahead and closing out your presentation at this time, which would be great. Yay, we get to see you now, <laughs> not just your preso. And I'd like to know, what advice do you have for companies looking to be acquired now? Oh, that's a beauty. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Pretty so, open-ended. Uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we, um, we entered an agreement to acquire Unrivaled, and, and we have a pipeline of two dozen or more active conversations going on at, at various stages. Um, and... You know, the, the industry has evolved quite a bit um, in the last couple of years, especially where uh, more folks from outside the industry have, have decided it's, it's okay, myself included, to, to actually come into the industry um, and that it was you know, a safe enough environment in which to operate. Uh, but with that said, I, I, I'm finding a lot of companies who um, still lack the appropriate um, uh, governance, controls, and processes, and operating uh, management, and financial and accounting management um, that really would, would help in the M&A process. In, in situations where we're having discussions with companies that don't have uh, good process, controls, financial and accounting resources, it, it, it's a much more difficult conversation. It's a much more difficult transaction to enact. Um, so from my perspective, uh, spending most of my career outside in tech uh, and only coming into the industry a few years ago, the biggest thing I would say is, is, is frankly having their house in order. That means legal compliance, regulatory compliance, process controls, accounting and finance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So since you came from a completely different industry, did TerraTech choose you? Or how, how, how did you, you know, sure. the, the, tell us our, uh, the story, please. Sure. I was um, in, um, in 
18 and 19, I um, had, had moved into operating roles uh, in cannabis companies, first as CFO and later as chief strategy officer. Um, the second company we sold uh, to Item 9 Labs, um, following which um, I, as I mentioned, joined Viridian as a consultant for a while doing restructuring plans. Um, for for TerraTech, um, we have some very supportive investors, uh, but they had um, carried the company, I might say, for, for quite some time through the ups and downs. And, and you know, frankly, there were, there were some difficult decisions that were made. And, and um, you know, TerraTech really needed, um, uh, you know, the, the lenders and investors really wanted, you know, some new leadership. Um, so I, I was was asked to join by um, you know, some of those investors I, with which I have a relationship, and because I also have a background in restructuring work, uh, to come in and and you know put TerraTech back on a solid footing. Thank you, thank you. And as we are closing now, would you please kindly tell our audience how they can contact you, Frank? Sure. So you can find me on our website, which is www.terratechcorp.com, uh, or you can reach me at first initial last name at terratechcorp.com, which is F as in Frank, K-N-U-E-T-T-E-L at terratechcorp.com. Thank you. And any final closing thoughts that you would like to impart to our audience? No, I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to present today and, and share our thoughts on the MSO market and M&A and expansion opportunities and, and you know, wish you all a remainder of a good weekend. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you again on Canada World. As do I. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.